Chapter 15, The Silver Sword's Secret. After Nancy had showered and put on a sports dress, the young people gathered in the garden, and Bess began her story. We decided to try surprising you, she said. Dave and I kept thinking about that woman who seemed to come from underneath the pavilion. So we decided to look for a secret opening. And we found one, Dave told the young sleuth. I feel now as though I really belong on your detective team, Nancy. There's a cunningly concealed door in the foundation, Bess continued. It swings inward on a hinge. The door was left slightly ajar. Nancy was thrilled. Did you find anything underneath the pavilion? Yes, we did, Dave replied. There's a three-foot space between the ground and the floor of the pavilion. I began digging in the dirt, and this is what I came up with. The young man reached behind a nearby bush and brought out a small metal chest. He opened the lid and took out a piece of paper on which were a drawing and two identical symbols that looked a little like men. They were joined at the base. Nancy stared at them. Why, this is a sketch of a silver sword plant, she exclaimed. The only place in the world that it grows is in the Haleakala Crater over on the island of Maui. You're practically right, Bert spoke up. There also are some silver sword plants in desolate sections of the island of Hawaii. Anyway, it's a marvelous clue, I'm sure, said Nancy. Did you find out what these symbols mean? She asked excitedly. George grinned. The translation is my contribution to this clue, she said. The symbol is Na Kanada, and that's Polynesian for men. I asked Kiabu, and he found an old book with ancient symbols of the Pacific Islands. Nancy was delighted with the additional find. This is simply wonderful. Thanks a million. When Bess asked what the next move would be, Nancy said, I think we should go to Haleakala Crater and try to find out if this clue was Grandfather Sakamaki's method of giving directions to whatever treasure he secreted. You mean, George spoke up, Kapuna Kani Sakamaki. She chuckled. That is Grandfather in Hawaiian. Nancy laughed. George, you've certainly been busy. All right, this is a clue, I'm sure, to Kapuna Kani Sakamaki's secret. You mean it's a summons to the crater? Bess asked, and Nancy nodded. Ned had said little up to this time. Now he voiced the opinion that possibly the woman in the white muumuu who had crawled from beneath the golden pavilion had buried the chest, and it was not connected with the secret at all. But why would she do such a thing? Bess asked. To draw Nancy Drew away from Kaluakua, Ned replied. If that was her reason, George spoke up, surely she wouldn't put it in such an obscure place. Remember, she left the door ajar, Nancy said. The young people talked at length about the two ideas regarding the silver sword plant and the symbols under which it meant men. Finally, they appealed to Kiabu for an opinion. I am sure Mr. Sakamaki Sr. put the chest there himself, the Hawaiian replied. He was a man who was very learned and also full of fun. I believe he enjoyed scattering the pieces of the puzzle for his grandson to put together. That convinces me, Nancy declared. I'm going to Haleakala Crater. Who wants to come along? Everyone wanted to make the trip, including Hannah Gruen. Kiabu offered to make the hotel and plane reservations and telephoned to Maui for a guide with a car to take them to the crater. This guide knows the mountains and the history of the volcanoes well, Kiabu said. If anyone on the island can help you solve the mystery, I am sure he can. His name is Moki Kuano, but just call him Moki. A little later, the caretaker informed the group that he had secured reservations for the following day on the afternoon plane. This meant they would be able to see the gorgeous sunset over the crater. Luncheon was served in the garden. Nancy and her friends had just finished eating when Kiabu brought her a message. The telegraph office phoned that your father will arrive by plane tomorrow morning. Would you like me to meet him? Thank you very much, Nancy replied. But I'd love to meet Dad myself. 
Ned offered to go with Nancy to the airport. They left Kaluakua before breakfast the next morning, deciding to get a snack at the field while waiting for Mr. Drew. The airplane was on time, and the couple watched as it circled the field and landed smoothly. Nancy had purchased a lay of bright red plumeria blossoms and stood at the fence eagerly awaiting her father. The passengers began to disembark. As each one appeared in the doorway of the plane, Nancy looked hopefully for Mr. Drew. Finally, the pilot, the co-pilot, steward, and stewardess alighted. It was evident that there was no one else aboard. Dad didn't come, Nancy exclaimed to Ned. Oh, I hope nothing has happened to him. Ned was worried too, but said cheerfully, Perhaps there is a message at the airline's office, or possibly your father sent another telegram. He and Nancy hurried inside the building and made inquiries, but there was no word from Mr. Drew. Nancy telephoned to Kaluakua and asked if anyone there had heard from her father. The answer was no. Going to the airline's reservation desk, Nancy asked, Could you find out if my father, Mr. Drew, made the reservation and then canceled it? The clerk made two telephone calls, then said that the lawyer had first canceled, then reinstated his reservation. But Mr. Drew never claimed the ticket, he added, so it was sold to someone else at the last minute. That's not like Dad, Nancy said worriedly to Ned as they walked away. I'm going to telephone Mr. Sakamaki in River Heights and see if he knows why Dad wasn't on the plane. She put in the long-distance call from the airport, and fortunately, Mr. Sakamaki himself answered. When he heard Nancy's story, he was astounded. I haven't heard of any change in your father's plans, he said. But I believe I can help you find out what happened. I'll phone a private detective I know in Los Angeles and ask him to work on the case. As soon as I learn anything, I'll let you know. Oh, please do, Nancy begged. I'm going directly to Kaluakua now, and I'll wait there until I hear from you. She and Ned hurried back to the estate. The first person they met was Hannah, who became greatly alarmed upon hearing that Mr. Drew had not arrived in Honolulu. He's probably being held prisoner by some of those double scorps, she fretted. She and the others were relieved to know that a detective was going to start work immediately to find out what had happened. Despite this, a feeling of gloom settled over Kaluakua, and all the mainlanders sat round talking in low tones. Do you think we should cancel our reservations to Maui? Ned asked Nancy as noon approached. Let's wait until one o'clock, she suggested. At that moment, the telephone rang, and she quickly picked up the receiver. The others had risen from their chairs and, with worried expressions, tiptoed forward. They were thunderstruck to hear Nancy cry out, Dad! There was a long, one-sided conversation. Finally, the young sleuth said goodbye to her father and turned to the others. That Los Angeles detective is a whiz, she remarked. He found Dad very quickly, although he had moved to another hotel. And he also learned that there was an imposter, one of the double scorps, using the name of Carson Drew. This man passed himself off as Dad and canceled the cable to me saying that my father's trip had been delayed. He also reinstated the plane reservation, which Dad had canceled. Of course, Dad never showed up to pay for it, so the fellow bought it at the last moment at the airport to use himself. Well, thank goodness Mr. Drew is all right, Hannah spoke up. Is he remaining in Los Angeles? He said he'd see us after we get back from the volcano country, Nancy answered. As she finished speaking, she heard a car coming up the driveway. Curious about the newcomer, everyone trooped to the front porch to see who was coming. Why, it's Janet Lee and Roy Chatley. Bess said in a low tone. I wonder what they want, George mused, frowning. The brother and sister jumped from the car. They gave fleeting smiles to the mainlanders, then opened the luggage compartment of the automobile. From it, Roy began taking out several suitcases. Presently, he picked up two of the bags and carried them to the porch. Turning to Ned, he said, 
Give me a hand with the rest of the luggage, will you? Nancy had stepped forward. We were glad to see you, but why the luggage? By this time, Janet was walking up the front steps. We've come to stay, she announced. Looks of astonishment came over the faces of Nancy and her friends. The young detective managed to say, You're staying? Mr. Sakamaki has invited you to come here? Of course not, Janet Lee answered. But as to an invitation, Roy and I don't need one. We have far more right to be here than you people have. We're staying. Furthermore, her brother added pompously, The sooner you folks move out, the better we'll like it. End of chapter 15